Hi all, our notable game today is from the Engine World. The TCEC Season 8 Super Final is underway. That takes place November the 6th to December the 1st, 2015. Commodore and Stockfish will be the clash for the highest computer chess title in what is going to be the strongest chess match in history between engines. So both engines over 3,200 each. And uh, on the way, Commodore, the reigning TCEC champion, had a smooth way to the final. In stage 1A, it, cruised, it easily cruised through to stage 2 and won stage 3 as well. Stockfish was merciless in stage 1B, score, starting with 11 out of 11, performed well in stage 2, and would have been very close to Commodore in stage 3 if it hadn't encountered the minor bug, which made it lose 1.5 points before the organising committee intervened. As a result, so the strongest engines are now in the super final, and it's like the match will be 100 classical games with uh, rules of changing the openings every uh, couple of games. So the, so the match is played with 50 different opening positions. Each engine plays both black and white of the same position. Uh, so the match will be presented with opening one used in games one and two, then opening two used in games three and four, etc. So in this game, Commodore 9.3 against Stockfish kicks off with d4, and we have d5, c4, e6, knight f3, knight f6, and we go into the Slav, semi-Slav, that's the classic triangle. We have e3, knight bd7, and now a very interesting and aggressive continuation, which I believe Magnus Carlsen has used uh, sometimes as well, among other super grandmasters. Queen c2, okay, we have bishop d6, and now a very, very interesting move in the opening book given to the computers, g4. It uh, becomes a very interesting theoretical exploration of this uh, g4, this flank move. Sometimes destabilizes black's central control because it means if black's gonna win this pawn, sometimes white can get in e4, e5. With a pawn on e5, there's, there's a bit of a bind on the dark squares. And also, of course, the g-file pressure is compensation. So it's not only about the e4 break, it's about the g-file. Black took on g4, so we immediately fill that g-file pressure, rook g1. Now, black is going to lose the g7 pawn. It doesn't want to just retreat. It doesn't, doesn't want, to, want to retreat and lose g7. It takes another pawn. So temporarily two pawns up. But now, one pawn up. And the move in my live book, human live book, is knight f8 here. That's the most popular. So we're following live book here, rook g2. And quite often, either bishop c7 or bishop d6 is played. Here we have bishop d6. And we're kind of, I believe, out of most, most opening theory now for this line, this gambit. So white right, pawn down. So it has both g-file pressure and the possibility for e4 quite quickly without black being able to do much about it. The knight's kind of stumbled around. It's not influencing the center as much as, say, this knight. So we have bishop d2. White prepares the castle queenside, potentially, knight g6. <clears throat> bishop e2. Now we have the move queen f6. It's not really attacking anything. The pawn's protected by the rook, so white can afford to just castle. And it's interesting, you know, black didn't, um, not in a rush to try and castle queenside, but there's a clear problem here. If bishop d7 and trying to castle queenside, then there's cd and knight takes d5. So it's not that easy for black to castle queenside. Instead, we see knight h4 activity on this side of the board without actually castling. So rook gg1. It's too dangerous to take this f2 pawn here. Uh, if it is taken, there's just a lot of pressure here. After e4, this this is great uh, compensation. With the king in the center, this is just far too dangerous. Uh, these pieces are just not mobilized. They're spectator pieces, I'll call them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the engines calculate that to be pretty bad. Once the lines open up against the king, that's going to be massive compensation. The king's still stuck in the center. So, basically, yes, the rook just retreated here. We see knight f3, so not trying to win the pawn, but just playing knight f3. So trying to weaken like white's uh, light squares a bit, taking that off, taking off the light square bishop. But the thing is, 
black with his pawns with its pawns on the light squares is vulnerable on the dark squares here so that can represent a full stra strategy for white to exchange off this dark square bishop for this one to try and infiltrate on the dark squares and e4 is not stopped here it's played so it threatens to really rip open the position and that king in the center on the e file so black plays d takes c4 and now we get in e5 marking out both d6 and f6 bishop drops back rook g3 again it's just far too dangerous to take uh, this pawn uh, white could consider things like doubling rooks and also of course there's things like knight e4 on the cards as well so the queen actually goes back to try and put pressure on this diagonal and exchange off queens if possible white is not having that knight e4 and you can see the dark square pain the grip on the dark squares and also the hemmed in bishop if only this bishop could be exchanged off for this one then these dark squares are going to be vulnerable we see bishop d7 and then we see king b1 if the king can be uh, tucked over here especially it'll be completely outside of the scope of any potential pin in the future now black dare not castle queenside in this position it actually played king d8 remarkably castling queenside is virtually fatal here if black castle queenside then there's a crushing move can you see i'll give you five seconds what would you play here not just positional but tactical completely at the same time in a way based on dark squares what would you play here with white okay bishop g5 is just so crushing because if takes then there's knight d6 jack for king, king and queen and the bishop's like a loose piece so it's just like immediately decisive bishop g5 so black couldn't really castle queenside possible to investigate in this game is c5 as possibility here uh, but maybe yeah it, it's that's an area which which might be interesting but king d8 was played and it looks weird but uh can this king get away with it slowly maybe go here later we see bishop g5 though the strategic exchange of the dark square bishop means also potentially the knight's going either to f6 or d6 after rook g8 bishop takes e7 king takes e7 so the next stage to exploit these dark squares would be a knight either going to this one or this one for the moment white avoids the exchange of rooks reinforces the knight and that means also this pawn's basically attacked black protects that now here's an interesting point you might think b3 but there's an invisible invisible pin here on b3 it might be the case that the quick c5 is useful for bishop c6 so if takes bishop c6 is not so not so easy so white plays a calm move before the storm king a1 getting out of any potential pin in advance of b3 if he plays b, if it plays b3 and gets a queen to c5 the queen and knight are coordinating beautifully here so this is a troublesome move b3 can't really be stopped the knight's been reinforced so what can white uh what can black do about white playing b3 he plays h5 yes that is a pass pawn but it's too many squares it seems here there's a king safety issue b3 exposes that so it would be terrible to take because of queen c5 check uh, so here we see rook g4 b takes c4 has black got away with just closing things up now with b4 to try and close the lines well unfortunately it's not just about the knight going to d6 and f6 now these pawns are quite useful for potentially playing d5 white plays queen e2 here which kind of unpins against the queen and means knight f6 is on the cards a5 knight f6 kicking the rook to f4 and a remarkable move in this position white doesn't spend any time playing f3 here but instead plays rook ed3 it vacates the e3 square for the queen 
that is taken and now queen e3 now threatens d5 not only protecting e5 but also the queen can come to c5 that lethal combination of the queen and knight can be become evident there queen f4 black tries to get the queens off white in this position doesn't mind plays d5 threatening queen c5 check among other things that's the main principle threat here queen c5 check to break into black's position so black takes on e3 but here a permanent advantage is created by white not just recapturing the queen but instead d6 check and we have a beautiful pawn chain supported hemming in the black king this bishop's miserable now taking here and white's immediately threatening rook g3 to g8 it looks to be positionally absolutely murderous this position there's no time to try and get the bishop out white is immediately threatening rook g3 and g8 so black desperately sacrifices the exchange to get rid of that monster knight if something like h4 then we just use the other rook to get to g8 and say so like this this is a disaster just taking on d7 after so black desperately takes on f6 we have e takes f6 can black really defend the exchange down when well, he tries to get his bishop doing something maybe c5 but it's not doing much it's just giving the c6 square rook g3 immediately threatening check and then d7 terminal rook a7 check so you see rook a7 defended against d7 at least here yeah. but rook g5 forking the two pawns that pawn is taken and here it seems black's pass pawn is not really going anywhere it's just dropping off and black seems to be in a helpless position basically he's tied down the exchange down and the advantage is simply increasing here now exchange of rooks by force and here the position got adjudicated there's an adjudication rule if both engines think the evaluation is a certain threshold it just gets adjudicated it's adjudicated as a, a win for Commodo. so Commodo 9.3 has won the first super final game this is fairly help uh, helpless for black the exchange down the king's not really going anywhere if you want to just quickly explore this final position the exchange down an incisive move would be for example rook b8 and the bishop's kind of defenseless to not to lose another pawn if he tries this rook b1 we can imagine now the king stepping out this king's stuck by contrast so I think uh, I think even a3 should be good here but let's go with king c3 yeah if taking what's the problem check is a problem that shows that's pretty tied down this, this kind of position is just overwhelming yeah you see that the bishop is not really helping the pawns and the king's going to get more and more aggressive it's a trivial win basically in this ending okay so that's just an example of the final position the rook coming to b8 starts to mop up the pawns basically once the pawns start getting mopped up the king comes in and the black king's just still stuck there so what do we see from this game from a theoretical perspective well this line against the slav defense is very exciting and dynamic white sacrificing two pawns getting one pawn back getting a quick e4 break but positionally it's all about the dark squares I think we just saw an engine masterclass in dark square exploitation the prophylaxis moves of getting the king right in the corner away from the pins meant there was maximum mobility then for the both the queen and knight the queen got centralized to play for to get to the c5 to f8 diagonal even sacking a pawn and at the right moment white allowed the queens to be exchanged to get another permanent advantage instead which encouraged black to desperately sacrifice the exchange so yeah a remarkable exploitation that the gambit seems to have a clear positional implication at least in this game of dark square domination 
So a fascinating struggle from a theoretical perspective. I think you'll agree. So an exciting match is underway and you can see the games at the chess bomb site. Uh, so a very, very exciting 100 game match is underway between the two top engines that reached the super final. Fantastic stuff. Congratulations to the organizers and everyone involved, Forenson, etc. Okay, comments or, qu comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.